Welcome to Unbiased Science, where we bring scientific method to the madness. I'm your host and public health scientist, Dr. Jess Steyer. And today I am joined by a very special guest, Dr. Joey Munoz, to talk all things nutrition. Um, is it okay if I call you Joey for the purpose of this yes, episode? for sure. Okay, Perfect. cool. And I'm obviously Jess, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's lots that we're going to talk about today. Um, I think it'll end up being a pretty, for lack of a better word, organic conversation. We'll just talk broadly about nutrition. Um, I'm going to pick Joey's brain about things like supplements, uh, a popular food app that I've received hundreds of messages about, and more. So before we dig in, let me introduce our guest for today. Dr. Joseph Joey Munoz is a nutritional sciences PhD who graduated from the Florida State University in 2020. His goal is to help individuals achieve their physique goals using scientifically based approaches. His academic research as a graduate student focused on investigating the role of different foods in the prevention and improvement of certain diseases, mainly osteoporosis and diabetes. Uh, additionally, he's been involved in conducting several clinical trials and has published scientific articles, taught uh, undergraduate courses in nutrition, as well as anatomy, uh, has presented his research findings in academic conferences, including the American Society for Nutrition. Um, so Joey, you, your page on, for, certainly everyone should be following you on Instagram. Your handle is Munoz. Is that right? Correct. Dr. Just D-R. Yep, doctor. Right, to DR. Authority there. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. So the other thing, Joey, is that you have an online coaching company for diet and nutrition. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. First and foremost, thank you so much for the introduction. That was so much more formal than I've ever introduced myself in a long time. It's been a minute since I've been involved in academia, but thank you so much for the uh, introduction. Yeah. And since I don't do academia anymore, um, I guess I would consider myself an entrepreneur. I own an online health and fitness coaching company. I work with clients one-on-one -on -one to help them improve their overall health and body composition through nutrition and exercise-based recommendations. My whole thing is sustainability, so having a habit-focused approach towards nutrition. And then aside from one-on-one -on -one coaching, we also have our coaching membership, which is uh, great for individuals who maybe don't want to work with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, but still want some structure and accountability. So that's pretty much who I am and what I do in a nutshell. And you have your own podcast. Is that right? Correct. Yes. The Dr. Joey Munoz show, because I couldn't think of anything more original <laughs> than my own name. <laughs> I love it. So actually, Joey, before we dig in, I'm curious, do you ever get people, and I hope I could ask this, this is, I'm just honestly, I want to pick your brain a little bit. Yeah. Um, the fact that you you have monetized, right, your expertise, your skill set, this is something that you have trained to do and you're providing a service for people. Mm -hmm. How do you like do you ever get pushback or flack about yeah. about that? Can you can we like talk yeah. about this? Because I'm just gonna be totally transparent that I of course I get accused all the time of <laughs> of being a yeah. quote unquote shill. I I have not actually figured out how to monetize this aside from some, you know, small partnerships, sponsorships, but really we're talking small potatoes. And it yeah. frustrates me because I feel like we our time and expertise have value, right? And and just uh -huh. as everyone, you know, we all have bills to pay, mortgages, all that good stuff people are working for money. So it's something that, that frustrates me. I'm just curious for your take on it. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, I ignore like 99% of the messages that I get because people are just ridiculous, right? But as far as the monetization thing, like how do I deal with this personally? Because it is annoying, right? And it's frustrating. Um, people will say things like, why should we trust you? You're just another coach selling programs online or whatnot. Um, and it's true. I do sell stuff online and I feel like, I mean, we all, we all do something for a career, right? Whether we decide to, I don't know, in our field, be in academia or be a dietitian or whatever it is, we all have to make a living. So 
that's the first thing like usually comes to mind that helps me not be bothered by what people are saying, right? Half the times it's just people trolling anyways. But in terms of a the perspective that I have on this, I guess is maybe what would be helpful to share. And I've been reading more like business and marketing books recently because I want to learn how to grow my business, right? Um, and I think the perspective that really helps me be okay with monetizing my services and wanting to grow my business is understanding that people are going to spend their money anyways, right? People are going to spend their money. If somebody's looking for health and fitness information, they're going to first consume some free content and then they're likely going to spend money somewhere, right? And I think if you're somebody who has a coaching service or sells a course or a book or whatever it may be, if you truly believe in your product, right, you know you're not a scammer. I know I'm not a scammer. Like I, I see the results that my clients get. I stand by everything that I do. I know I provide a good service. I think it is my responsibility to try to get people to purchase my product over somebody else's product that may be not as good or for lack of a better term, right? Because there's a lot mm -hmm. of really bad stuff online. And so if somebody's going to spend 50 bucks on whatever it is, they can come across some random person's content that they might buy and at best might not help them at all. And at worst might actually do damage, right? So as individuals working in this field, I think it's our responsibility to really help people to the best of our ability. And there are people that are going to be paying customers and realistically, we can only do so much for free, right? So the way that I see it is like, hey, I put a lot of time and effort and focus in developing products that I think are really, really good and actually help people improve their overall health and fitness. I want to share this with you. I'm never really pushy when it comes to sales. I simply just present what I do. I present what my clients have achieved. And if you are looking for a service that's going to help you improve overall health and fitness, I'm your guy, right? That's kind of the mindset that I have. So when people talk about like, you're just selling something online, it's like, yes, I need to sell something online because I need to live. I have a family to provide for. That said, I think I have a really high quality service. And since I do have a good service, I stand behind it and I promote it because I don't feel like I'm a scammer, even though that's what mm -hmm. people say online. Right? right. That's pretty much my overall perspective on that. Yeah. No, that that makes total sense to me. And I mean, the fact that we're now living this digital life, you're offering yeah. a service online that people could could purchase and partake in all over the I mean, I, I'm, I don't know if your uh, your clients are all over the country or even outside of the mm -hmm. country, but it allows you to reach a wider audience. I don't, I, I'm asking sort of just on a personal level, because it's something that I, I guess, you know, this world of science communication, it's it's something that even I myself have said, you know, beware of people who are trying to sell you things. But it's mm. it's more than that. It, it's not so black and white. You know, if they're trying to sell you things that don't have any evidence to support them or, mm. you know, are not science based. And so in, in the science communication world, I feel like when I'm putting out information, if, if people get a whiff of, of me trying to sell something, it's like, oh, she's yeah. just trying to sell something and automatically discredited. Um, but at the same time, I love science communication and I'm trying to figure out a way to make this my my main gig and you're yeah. i mean that, that has to my, my time and expertise do you know, they, they why shouldn't they be monetized so yeah. it's just something that i myself am grappling with i have total respect for what you're doing and i think it makes total sense i just wanted to get that out of the way yeah, just yeah, in yeah. case anyone has that question okay but speaking of other things that people are selling let's talk supplements because sure. supplements, I don't, I don't know if maybe you put supplements in a different category. How do you feel about people who are selling supplements or how do you feel even more, you know, broadly about supplements? And then of course I'll give my two cents. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, supplements are fine. I have no issue with supplements. I have issues with the claims that are made around supplements because there's nothing wrong with supplements and some supplements can be beneficial in certain contexts. I think there's a couple of things here, like people need to understand that supplements are just that they're supplemental, right? They're not going to outweigh the negative impacts of like poor lifestyle, right? And poor lifestyle, including exercise, sleep, stress management, nutrition, et cetera. And I include all those because we often think like, I feel like a lot of people think like nutrition is the only thing that matters and nutrition is really important, but like, it's only a component, right? It's only a piece of the pie. There's so many important things. Um, like if you have a really healthy diet, but you don't exercise and you don't sleep well, like 
that's also not good, right? And if you have a poor diet, and you, you guys get the point, like all of the different factors really matter. Um, and I mentioned that because people like to take supplements or, or want a supplement to like cover up their deficiencies when it comes to overall lifestyle, right? And we need to understand that supplements, for the most part, have a very minimal impact. Right? Even when we look at the research literature, like even supplements that help tend to help very little. And supplements that have big impacts tend to be those that help somebody if they have a particular deficiency in a certain vitamin or mineral, right? So when people ask me, should I take uh, vitamin D supplements? That's a really popular one. It's like, well, are you deficient in vitamin D? No, then you probably don't need it. It won't right. hurt, but it's probably not going to benefit you as much as like the claims that you see online um, claim that it's going to help, right? So for me, when it comes to supplements, coming from a like maybe more sports nutrition background as well, the things that I tend to recommend to most people that I think most people would benefit from are creatine for body composition because there's just an overwhelming amount of evidence showing that creatine is beneficial and you can get creatine from your diet just not at the appropriate dose of five grams per day um protein supplementation even though i don't consider protein a supplement it's really just food but in powder form so we call it a supplement most people have a hard time meeting their protein needs from just food so protein's great I tend to say, like, if you want to take a multivitamin, that's fine to just cover your basis, right? Because most of us probably don't get every single nutrient from our diet. And taking a multivitamin is cheap and effective. And hey, if, you know, it's not doing much, you're just going to pee it out anyways. It's not that big of a waste of money either. Um, and then potentially an omega-3 supplementation, um, especially if people don't consume enough omega-3 from seafood or other plant-based sources. Those are the main ones that I think most people could probably benefit from because one, they've been shown to be effective and two, they're pretty cheap, right? Mm -hmm. So that's like general health and sports performance type of supplements. If we go a step beyond that, then we have like more specific type of supplements. And I honestly don't even know like what's being marketed nowadays because I don't keep up with the supplement world at all. But I know that people make really ridiculous claims about supplements and then charge a of money and sorry i'm not sure if you allow words like <laughs> the show but we're gonna bleep <laughs> okay, okay, okay i'll i'll do better um but for example i know somebody like gary brecca sells like methylated b vitamins right and it's it, there's like this whole marketing scheme behind it where he says that they're like a hundred times more effective than normal b vitamins and it's just made up like there's really no research to support those things so in that area, like there's no, there's no evidence to support that like methylated B12 is better than just a B12 supplement, right? And that's where things really start to bother me because people take advantage of the fact that other individuals don't know anything. Right. And so they're really good marketers. They come up with a message um, that sounds really appealing and then they make a ton of money off of it. And the thing is they take something like a B vitamin which is dirt cheap and they market it in a unique way and make it really expensive. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that really bothers me more than anything. Mm -hmm. I guess that would be my, my overall take on supplements there. And we can go a little bit deeper on specific ones if you'd like. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, so it, <laughs> before we hit record, I was, you know, obviously we were, we were chatting a little bit and I was saying my overall approach to supplements is I feel like 99% of the time they're, they're going to be unnecessary, right? Unless you have a deficiency, unless you are pregnant or trying to get pregnant, unless you're elderly, yeah. you know, we know that there are certain deficiencies. Um, but, you know... <sighs> I struggle for all the reasons that you struggle. They tend to be the, the claims that people make about these things. Yeah. I mean, first of all, there's all kinds of issues with labeling. There have been studies done that look at the actual ingredients versus what's on the labels. And more often than not, something is either not disclosed or it's not disclosed in the proper amount or, you know, there, there are all kinds of issues yeah. with that. Um, I've spoken at length about how supplements are not uh, regulated in the same way that medications are regulated, right? So it sort of feels like the Wild West and it always frustrates 
frustrates me when people are so critical of, you know, medications or vaccines and they're talking about, oh, we don't have enough evidence, but then they'll run and take a supplement that has absolutely no data except maybe some really teeny tiny preclinical study or something. Um, it's just, it's mind boggling to me. So I think the hypocrisy mm. of it all really frustrates me. To your point, I think, you know, if someone's taking a supplement, it's probably not going to do harm. I do think it tends to come from a place of privilege. Like if you're able to take a supplement, like, you know, sure. th these things are expensive and they're probably not necessary. And we know we can get the majority of our nutrients through diet and it's better to get through diet. But as you said, like sometimes I'll go through a week where I'm just really stressed. I'm head down doing work and I'm eating Rice Krispie treats instead of having a salad, you know, or whatever it is. Yeah. And so I don't know. At the same time, we've also talked about, you know, there there can be toxicity, right? Certain supplements, you, there are drug interactions, you can overdose on, on certain uh, ingredients and supplements. So there are things that people should be aware of. They're sure. not, it's not this harmless, right? It's not totally harmless and benign. You, you can't, yeah. I don't know. It, I just wanted to say that. Um, what else? I oh, I'm glad that you brought up vitamin D, Joey, because I get a bunch of people who live in colder climates in particular. I know you live in Florida. I'm here in Western Mass and it's April and we had snow a week ago. Um, so what would you say to people who, you know, they're like, oh, but I live in a colder climate. I'm not getting so much sun. I feel like I'm vitamin D deficient. I, I want to hear more about vitamin D. And I also am curious, um, about the whole diagnosis of a deficiency, because I think there are two, I mean, there's lots we could talk about, but two things stand out. One is a lot of times companies will sell these tests to diagnose deficiencies, but then they also happen to sell you <laughs> the supplement to address yeah. the deficiency. And two, there are lots of issues with our healthcare system and people can't always get in to their physician to get a diagnostic panel, or maybe they're not testing mm. for specific things. And so people will say, well, how do I know if I have a deficiency? So what do you say to people? Yeah, that's a tough one in those different circumstances, right? Like my general recommendation is like, get blood work done at least once a year. Just know where you're at baseline with most things, right? Um, now in that follow-up question that you asked in the circumstance that somebody doesn't have access to getting blood work done, I'm unsure. I really don't know how I would address that situation, right? Cause it's difficult. Like there's a very direct way of knowing whether or not you're deficient, get some blood work done, see what your results show. If you're deficient, supplementation can be helpful. The thing about like colder climate or where you live, it, it's difficult to give a blanket recommendation that's applicable to everybody. Because some people will be able to convert more vitamin D in low sunlight than others, right? Just based off genetics, skin color, et cetera. There's a whole host of factors. So if somebody just came to me like, hey, I live in a colder climate. Should I take vitamin D? I can't really answer that question with just that, right? I, I will say this, like vitamin D supplementation itself seems to be pretty damn safe. And if you can afford it and want to take it, it's probably not going to cause much harm unless you're taking like ridiculously high doses. Cause I know sometimes people do recommend insanely high doses for reasons that aren't really substantiated. The main recommendation I give all my clients, whether it's vitamin D or magnesium or whatever it is that they're looking into, it's like, Hey, just go get some blood work done. Um, whatever you're deficient in, we should try to address your diet. And if we can't really make many modifications in your diet for whatever reason, then let's take a supplement and that should help. That's generally my, my approach to, to anything related to supplementation. I'm not sure if you wanted to go a slightly different direction with that question. No, no, no. You, you hit the nail on the head. I, that's, this is the conversation. I, I think that, you know, I, I'm sort of having my my moment coming into my own as a science communicator, and I'm reflecting on some things that have come out of my own mouth where it's like I automatically I've made it black and white where it's like all mm -hmm. so you don't you don't ever need supplements. And it's not that I'm backtracking, but I, I think that there it's like you're alluding to it's there's no one size fits all. We have to take things on a case by case basis. Again, mm -hmm. I, I tend to think supplements are 
over marketed. They make claims that are often not substantiated. There are issues with yeah. labeling. There is a lack of regulation. There are lots of issues. And I don't think that the the immediate thought for most people should be, oh, let me go out and get a bunch of supplements. You know, I I, I don't. No. I, I think we all want there to be literally a magic pill for us to take that's going to improve our health. Um, yeah. I think the reality is a lot, as we both know, a lot more nuanced. Um, but then also realizing there are issues to like access to care, access to testing to be properly diagnosed. It's just, it's tricky. So I guess I'm happy yeah. to have this conversation that introduces those different variables, that nuance. Um, I don't know. Like I, I just, one of my very best friends, she was talking about how she's so exhausted lately and she thinks she mm. might have an iron deficiency. She also has celiac and some other stuff. So she's feeling like even when she tries to increase her iron intake from food, there might be some malabsorption is issues and she's not getting enough. She is making an appointment with her physician, but in the meantime, she's like, I'm going to go out and take some iron supplements just in case. And so again, in that situation, it's like, I'm not going to judge. I, I understand, you know, there's a problem. She's trying to address it. In the meantime, she's doing, you know, she's taking supplements. But I guess for me, I also just want people to be aware, like, even if it's a supplement that's all natural or herbal or whatever it is, that does not mean it's 100% safe or that there won't be interactions or that there can't be toxicity. Um, you know, and, and the other thing I, I like to remind people, I always say the dose makes the poison, but the dose also makes the benefit. So if someone is making a claim about a particular ingredient that's in a supplement, I'm trying to think of an example, of course, right this second I can't, it's like the amount in reality that you'd actually need to consume to see a clinical benefit is likely not what you're getting in a, you know, in a supplement. So there's just lots to consider. So I just, I'm glad that we, that we had that chat. Yeah. So thank you. And I wanted to <laughs> add one last thing, like, Typically, the supplements that are marketed and people making a ton of money off of are like pretty unique things, right? They're not really basic stuff. Like you don't hear people marketing just a multivitamin and like making a ton of money off it, right? Like, because there's nothing really there to like claim about just the multivitamin that gives you basic vitamins and minerals, right? right. And that's why I do tell most people like, hey, the best place to start if you were going to take something is probably just something like a multivitamin to cover your bases. If you know that, that you're not eating enough fruits and veggies and you don't have enough variety in your diet, and maybe you got blood work done last year and your doctor told you you're deficient in certain things, like I would say, and I'm not going to say 100% here, but maybe 99.99% .99 of people aren't going to have any sort of harm from just taking a safe multivitamin, right? And there mm -hmm. are reputable companies that are very big companies that have had their products tested. If you look for like, uh, what's the, is it GMP, good manufacturing pra uh, practices, right? There, there are certain like, um, essentially like certifications or I forget the, the, the correct word here, but there are certain like, um, yeah, certifications essentially that can increase your trust in a particular brand, right? So like Nature's Made is like a huge brand that sells multivitamin. And they have like the GMP certification on there, which means that it's been tested and it has what it says that it has. And the multivitamin is not $100 a month. You're maybe spending like 10 to 15 cents per day on your multivitamin, which for most people is affordable, right? So I'd say for most people, that's probably the best place to, to start. And that's probably what you're going to get the most benefit from anyways. And it's even then, it's still going to be a small benefit compared to everything else. Where it starts to get tricky, is when people start to market stuff that is like kind of off the radar, right? Like some herbal supplements, for example. These herbal supplements do X, Y, Z. And, and full disclosure, like I work with a supplement company. I work with Outwork Nutrition, which is Lane Norton Supplement Company. And I um, align with the company because we disclose every single ingredient that we put in our supplements. We disclose the quantity that we put in the supplement. We cite the research that we use to provide the claims and we don't make any ridiculous claims at all, right? So I, I say that because I do think there are supplement companies trying to do a good job and not necessarily like make ridiculous claims either. For example, you were talking about dosing, right? Uh, a big issue in the, in the sports nutrition field, which I know is a little bit different than just like general health supplements, but there's a, lo a lot of overlap here is how popular the use of proprietary blends are right? It's like, oh, we have a proprietary blend and these are the ingredients we have, but we're not telling you the amount of the ingredients. That's an issue. 
I tell people, if you see a proprietary blend, just don't buy it. A supplement should tell you exactly what's in it and the quantity, right? So for, and, and the reason why a lot of sports supplements do this is because from a pre-workout perspective, um, they underdose. That's just plain and simple. Like they underdose and they put a couple of, of cheap ingredients in there that don't really do much and it's marketed to be unique. Um, and for example, with Outwork Nutrition, we take the opposite approach. We just include a couple of things that have been shown to be effective. Uh, when we talk about pre-workouts, there's really two main things we're looking for. One, a stimulant. It's mainly just caffeine, right? We know caffeine can improve sports performance. And we include a couple of things that help with um, essentially blood flow. So things like citrulline malate, beta alanine, which can help buffer blood pH. So prevents lactate buildup essentially, which helps, which helps you perform a little bit better. But those are the main three ingredients. Now people see this and they're like, and they compare it to something else that has like a bunch of ingredients. And it's funny because in the sports supplement field, like more ingredients, people tend to think it's better. And then in like the nutrition space, people that don't know what they're talking about, they're like all these ingredients. It's funny how different those two perspectives are, but it's like, there are supplement companies trying to do a good job too, right? Like if you present the ingredients in your product, if you, if you're thinking about whether or not a company is reputable or not, it's hard to tell, but these are some signs that I think I would look for clear outline of what the ingredients are, right? Two, like, are the claims substantiated by research? More, most supplement companies will cite their studies on their website. And most people don't have the skills necessary to read research correctly. So that's a difficult one to tell. But two, like, do they list the exact amounts of every ingredient? A lot of supplements don't. They just tell you it's their secret proprietary blend. And that's just Again, BS, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Um, and three is just like, what claims do they make, right? On our website, for example, we seriously state, we're like, this is not going to give you any crazy sports performing benefits. This is just to help support everything that you're doing with your workouts and your nutrition. It might give you a small boost in performance, which is true, which could help long term. From a marketing perspective, it doesn't make us as much money, but we feel good about the message that we put out. Mm -hmm. Is it specific to, because I'm actually not familiar with the supplement, is yeah. that specific to uh, to athletes? To it's This is a sports supplement? So at work, yes. So at work nutrition, we sell like, I guess, performance related supplements. I was going to say for lifting, but really is applicable for any sort of performance related endeavor. Uh, so the pre-workout is to just help boost performance slightly during training, like boost arousal essentially. So if you take some caffeine, you're going to boost arousal, right? And improving blood flow can help with nutrient delivery and oxygen delivery during exercise. So citrulline malate uh, is probably the most popular ingredient used there. And the issue with something like citrulline malate is that it can be pricey. So a lot of people put it in proprietary blends and give you like half the dose that you actually need. And the truth is you need six to eight grams based off the research that we have to really improve blood flow and, and, and increase nitric oxide production. That's the main mechanism there. So yes, that's a sports specific supplement. We have a whey protein we have um, a recovery supplement that helps with like muscle soreness and stuff like that. But they're all just like very basic ingredients, no ridiculous claims. And the research is cited on the website, which is something that I really like. And that's why I support that company. Hmm. But most companies in the sports nutrition uh, field, like do the exact opposite. <laughs> right. So there's, there's a lot of bad stuff out there for sure. Yeah. So before we hit record, this is unrelated, somewhat related, tangentially related. Um, I was saying that last night when I was trying to um, fall asleep, and of course, my way of doing that is by picking up my phone and scrolling through TikTok to stimulate my, my brain right before sleep. And I was seeing, I guess there's this viral trend on TikTok about um, a glycine. I don't know if it's a supplement, if it's a powder. I don't know exactly how it's being sold, but I guess um, there... So, First of all, we should we should talk about what glycine is and whatever. But people are buying industrial grade glycine based on some claims being made on TikTok about how it can be. I forget what the exact claims are, but it's like broadly good for brain health, gut health, good you know your um, cognitive whatever. You know there there are, there are some claims about it, so people are running out and and buying this from some industrial factory, I believe, out of China. And the reality is, Joe, Joey, I'm sure you could explain much better than I could, is that glycine, and tell me if I'm wrong here, it's a non-essential amino acid that we typically, we get from a variety of different foods, meats, veggies, legumes, you know, all kinds of stuff. 
And except in extremely rare <laughs> circumstances, people are typically never deficient in glycine, and there really wouldn't be a reason to supplement, period, let alone with an industrial grade glycine. Can you, what did I say? Every, was that all correct? Anything to? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we were talking about <laughs> talking about this in the general context of how people market these things because it's the same message behind every set whether it's glycine or arginine or whatever amino acid or whatever right. nutrient right it's always the same exact thing so first and foremost when people say this thing fill in the blank we'll use glycine here is beneficial for brain health mm -hmm. uh your your gut health whatever the claim is right it typically comes from the fact that these things again fill in the blank play a role in the metabolism of that organ, right? So I'm mm -hmm. sure glycine plays a certain role in brain health. Right. I'm sure glycine plays a certain role in gut health. The same way that I can say that water is important for brain health and gut health and muscle health. Because right. if you don't have water, you are dehydrated. And you could die, right? So you could you could fill in the blank there with water, something super basic, right? That everybody mm -hmm. understands. You can fill in the blank and say the same thing for sodium. And actually, sodium is another one that's marketed a lot, right? They don't say sodium; they'll say an electrolyte supplement, but it's just table salt. It's just flavored table salt for the most part. And it's like salt is important for muscle contraction. It's important for brain health. It's like yes, that is true. It is important, right? If you don't have sodium, your body will not function properly. Now the question that's just like baseline level what the what the claims are being based off of and that's all that people go by right nobody thinks a little bit beyond that and what you have to think about a little bit beyond that is the main question to ask is just because this thing is important for xyz does it mean that supplementing with the, with this thing will improve xyz because those two things are not synonymous like you mentioned, Jess, you get more than enough glycine from your diet. If you are not deficient in protein, you are not deficient in glycine. If you live in the U.S., you're likely not deficient in protein, right? Um, and deficient in protein, like, it's pretty difficult to be deficient in protein. I, I mentioned that because I, I don't know what your audience is, but my audience, everybody's, like, focused on body composition and weight loss and all this stuff. And so protein is a popular topic. And we tend to talk about protein, optimal protein recommendations for body composition, which is very different than protein requirements um, to not be deficient, right? It's very, very different. So being deficient in protein is actually pretty difficult. If you, uh, you know, live in the US and have a, a varied diet, you probably are not deficient in protein. If you were, you'd know because you have some pretty bad symptoms. Um, but you're not deficient in glycine, right? And all of these things there, it doesn't just because something is important for something doesn't mean that more will benefit that thing, right? So, mm -hmm. if I drink more water, it's not going to necessarily be better. If I take more salt, it's not necessarily going to be better. Our bodies require a certain amount to function properly, and if we take more than that certain amount, it may or may not be helpful. In many contexts, it doesn't really do anything, right? So, when people talk about these claims, like the main thing to do is not say. Glycine helps gut health. The important thing to look at is, are there clinical studies in populations that resemble my, myself that show benefit with this supplement, right? Because, and the reason why I bring this up, and by the way, I know nothing about the literature on glycine, okay? But for example, for gut health, first off, is there research showing that glycine improves gut health? And this is such a nuanced conversation because when we talk about gut health, we have to make sure we're talking about the particular outcomes that we're interested in. But let's say those things align, right? Let's say those things align. Um, or let's say we just use the term inflammation because people talk about inflammation a ton, right? Does glycine help inflammation or gut health or brain health or whatever it is? Um, there needs to be clinical research on this, meaning that there are studies where they've taken humans and given them the supplement and they see an improvement in the outcome relative to a placebo and relative to a placebo is very important because most things that you give people will benefit the outcome because of the placebo effect. So you need to give people an actual placebo to compare to, to make sure that the supplement that you're giving is better than a placebo, right? Because if it's not better than a placebo, then it's not really telling you much. Now that is step one. Let's say you look at the research on glycine and gut health, and there is no research showing that it benefits gut health. 
then that's a quick, <laughs> quick search there. Like it doesn't really benefit, right? The second aspect is like, let's say there are some benefits. That doesn't mean that it's going to benefit everyone, right? You have to look at now the population that's being studied. And now let's say that the population is somebody with a particular chronic disease, let's say Crohn's disease. Again, I know nothing about glycine supplementation. I'm just speaking out loud here, but the type of thought process that you should have when you try to look at these things. Okay, I have Crohn's disease. There's, there seems to be some benefits of glycine for gut health. Let's see if it's specific in individuals with Crohn's disease. Okay, it is beneficial in people with Crohn's disease. Now you can be pretty confident that glycine supplementation may help you specifically because that's the question you're trying to answer and the third question to answer if you're deciding on like which glycine supplement to take you purchased a glycine supplement is what was the form that was given in the study and at what dose and sometimes even like when was it given like methodology is really important right so most importantly is probably dose it's like how how much was given because sometimes a supplement that you're buying has like 50% of what was shown to be effective in studies. And that's the one thing, like there are so many parallels here when people talk about red wine being healthy because of resveratrol. It's like the dose is so important. The amount of resveratrol, you need need a couple of bottles of wine. Like (laughs) that's not, that's not going to be helpful. Right. So the dose is really important. The, 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 the type of supplement, because um, it could be glycine blank, right? Like they can, they can be attached to a salt or something else. Like you want to make sure that the supplement that you're taking is the same type as what's being studied. We see this a lot in the creatine uh, supplementation field where like people try to sell because creatine monohydrate is what's been studied thousands of times. <laughs> it's super cheap. It's super effective. Now you can't really market creatine monohydrate because you can't make it more expensive because there are people selling it really cheap. So what do people do instead of selling creatine monohydrate to sell creatine hydrochloride or creatine blank? And it's just like it's creatine attached to a different molecule. And they're like, this is better because of X, Y, Z, or it dissolves better or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, there is no research on that. Like, you don't know if it's equally effective. You literally don't know if it's equally effective. It has to be the same thing that was tested. And I think recently, I could be wrong here, there was one type of creatine that was being marketed for better dis- dissolvability because creatine monohydrate doesn't dissolve well, so it's somewhat gritty when you drink it. And so this company's marketing was at like, hey, our creatine, which is not creatine monohydrate, it's creatine something else, dissolves really well, so it's easier to drink, which was true. There wasn't really any research to substantiate its effectiveness. And I think there was some research conducted in the in the past couple of years showing that that type of creatine specifically isn't absorbed as well. So it's like you fix the issue of dissolvability, but I rather have something that doesn't dissolve and is more effective and actually. Right. So it's pretty, it's pretty complicated, but that's usually the the route that people take when they market something. It's like, Hey, this thing is, is important for blank, blank, blank. It's like, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That doesn't mean that your supplement is going to benefit those things. Exactly. They take seeds of truth and then blow it out of context, out of proportion and make, you know, irresponsible marketing claims in my opinion essentially a a leads to b b leads to c c leads to d so a leads to d and that's not always true i love that by the way joey you have a very like calm and measured approach to things i really i appreciate it so much and you embrace the nuance which is something that i very much appreciate so you know it's so funny people tell me i have a soothing (laughs) voice and when i listen to my own voice i absolutely hate it oh my god i'm sitting here i'm like Go to Don't sleep. Fall asleep. It's right. <laughs> All right. So before we wrap, I just want to talk about this app. And I, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. I believe it's pronounced the Yuka app, Y U K A. I cannot tell you how many messages I've received about this app. I believe it was launched out of France. I think it was 2017. It is now a wildly popular app used by millions of people. Let me, I see, I I pulled a little description here. Give me just one sec. Okay, so it's this food rating app. And what, what it is, and I downloaded it because I wanted to see it in action before I spoke about it. So it's an app that it, it opens up a scanner and you can scan the barcode of any any food or drink or whatever it is. And then it gives you a rating out of 100. And so okay. what it does, let me just tell you. So Yuga rates food based on nutritional quality. So that's 60% of the rating. And additives. 
30%. And then the remaining 10% considers whether the product is organic. <sighs> All right. The app uses the Nutri-Score method. So it ranges from A, which is good, to E, which is the worst. And it assigns associated colors with red indicating a food to avoid, green signifying a safe choice. Now, holy moly. I mean, I'm curious what your take on this, and I have more I'd love to share. But for me, it again, it falls into this all or none, one size fits all, blanket vilification of things like conventional versus organic, the idea that all additives are detrimental. Um, there's no conversation about the amount of additives that, you know, there, yeah. there's no, it just, it feels very blanket. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you brought this up to me, the first thing I thought about was <laughs> um, there might be an, a way to actually make an app like that that's actually useful and helpful. Right. And, Get on and it, Joey. It would just be like, <laughs> what do you mean by nutritional quality? Right. Because when they're talking about additives and organic, <laughs> I mean, if, if we talk about organic, that could technically fall under nutritional quality. So the fact that it's a different thing altogether is funny because if we look at nutritional quality, we're just looking at how much of specific nutrients are in that food. Right. There's some evidence that some organic produce is a little bit higher in some vitamins and minerals. So maybe the organic version has a little bit higher nutritional quality. I don't know. I have a million thoughts around this. I think there's one, first and foremost, a really maybe good way of making an app like that. Because I do think like, I don't know, I feel like as, as professionals, we want to be, we want everybody to understand things the way that we do, right? Um, I feel like I have a really good understanding and grasp of nutrition overall. I have a really good understanding of my diets and I, I know what food choices to make. And I feel good and confident about navigating nutrition. Most people don't, right? And getting to this point takes a lot of time and work. And I do think there is a place for something that is simple to help individuals get there, right? Because I don't know, sometimes, I, and I go back and forth on this, like, simplicity, the, the more you simplify something, the more you remove nuance, right? And if you remove nuance, there's obviously going to be some information that's not as accurate as it can be. But that said, I still think that some things that are simple can have an overall positive effect, right? And I talk about this a lot because sometimes people like, for example, a ketogenic diet. And I talk to my clients about this too. It's like, is it an optimal diet for health? No, obviously not. Do some people improve their health following a ketogenic diet? Yeah, right? Why? A number of reasons. Maybe they were following a super... A uh, highly processed diet prior, like a typical Western American diet. Now they're eating more whole foods. They've reduced their caloric intake. They're consuming more protein and overall health markers improved. So sometimes like what's optimal isn't what's necessary. What we need is something that's going to help people improve a little bit. And I think there are places for apps or tools like this that you can scan something and tells you like maybe good and, good and bad is definitely not the right word, but mm -hmm. nutritious or less nutritious, right? And that's not right. as good as. That's not a great marketing uh, term either, but maybe it's like nutritious versus like fun food because I like using that term, right? Yeah. But I wouldn't rate it based off of organic or additives. I would rate it based off of things like, is it a whole food or is it an ultra processed food? Is it something that's high in fiber or protein or healthy fats or not? Like the, the grading scale would be completely different. But then even then, Joey, it's so funny because I've, I've talked a lot about processed foods and ultra processed foods, and I sort of take the mentality, the approach of, I don't think we should just blanketly vilify that. Yeah. I mean, all together, because I know, as I said earlier, like occasionally I'll have some processed foods, ultra processed foods. I mean, again, you were talking about their access issues for some people. I mean, we, we've spoken about that. It's It's more about patterns and the share yes, of yeah. your diet, right? Comprised yeah. of these yeah. foods. So I think that's what frustrates me is like, okay, I open up my app, I'm scanning something that, you know, thing of Oreos, and it's going to be like, alert, alert, terrible. Like, I, I, should I eat Oreos, you know, every day yeah, for the rest of my life? No, probably not. You know, but, it, yeah. but every but once that, in a while. That, even that highlights the importance because I would say you can eat an Oreo every day for the rest of your life, right? Because it also depends on everything else you eat. It's like, yeah, so I was going to bring up like the, one of the main issues with these apps is that it's just 
everything in the nutrition space is so hyper fixated on specific foods when that doesn't matter. Like what matters exactly. is overall dietary patterns. So maybe an app like this where you can scan what you're eating and it tells you like overall is this a healthy diet? Right. It can actually be measured pretty effectively, right? Like you can look at somebody's overall diet and be like, hey, maybe these small modifications can be made. And when you look at overall diet, you're looking at the foods they're eating, but also the quantities. Right? right. So like you mentioned Oreos. And people are gonna disagree with this, whatever. And I talk about this all the time and people are like, how can you ever say that somebody should eat an Oreo? I'm not saying you should or you shouldn't. I'm saying you can and be perfectly healthy. Um you're just getting right. a little bit of sugar and some processed food and you're having one Oreo a day. Like it, it literally doesn't matter. And in some contexts, it can be beneficial. For example. Mental health. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because in like the sports nutrition field, there's so much strategic use around things like candy and very simple carbohydrates mm -hmm. to fuel performance. Again, if you are a long distance runner and you run hours on end, you need very simple carbohydrates to fuel you during exercise. You're not going to eat um, some high fiber, some, some legumes, some beans, because you're not going to digest it in time. It's not going to get into your bloodstream quickly. It's going to cause an upset stomach. Like, you're going to poop yourself. Not, it's not what you're looking for. It's Sorry. true. It's true. But you could have um, something like an Oreo, right? Or something maybe even simpler, like some crackers that are just gonna deliver some glucose quickly. So everything, first off, is context specific. Mm -hmm. Second, quantity really matters. There's no such thing as a good or a bad food. You, mm -hmm. can, you can seriously be, un this is unlikely to happen because minimally processed foods tend to be very satiating and low, low in terms of caloric density. But you could theoretically be unhealthy eating things like beans, fruits, veggies, whole foods if you just like eat way too much of it right so quantity really matters yeah. um there's the perfect example i forget of the guy i forget his name but it's the he was a nutrition professor who lost weight eating like exclusively twinkies and fast food and he supplemented to 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 not be deficient in anything so he was taking like a multivitamin and just eating like twinkies and candies and stuff and he lost a ton of weight and he was uh overweight to begin with and all of his blood biomarkers improved drastically and he just did it to prove a point, essentially, right? That like, right. hey, good choices matter, but quantity really matters. Um, and the second thing he, he mentioned was like, I wouldn't recommend this because I felt miserable. I was really hungry all the time. I wasn't really fully satiated. It's obviously not a healthy, healthy, quote unquote, diet, whatever that means, too, because there's so much nuance there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like see, viewing nutrition from the lens of good and bad food is really ridiculous. and then rating foods on whether they're healthy or not because of additives is really ridiculous because additives can be very healthy right like, yes yeah so I, i'm making a video on this now even when you talk about like fortified breads it's like yo they're adding vitamins and minerals yep yeah and people are like these are not natural it's like it's the same exact stuff yeah maybe they're in a slightly different form for stability for example but they are the same thing they are the same thing right there's no difference it's so funny people don't know stuff. I remember talking to a friend years ago when I used to personal train, probably back in like 2015, 2016, around there. There was a colleague of mine who was also a personal trainer. I don't remember how the conversation came about, but we were talking about iron in food. And he was just like, oh yeah, yeah, but the iron in food is different from like iron. And I'm like, no, no, it's actually iron is iron. He's like, no, no, it can't be like, how can I, it's like, it is iron, right? Like, right. and people like to say that like, the natural form is different than this form. It's like, it all comes, if we distill it, <laughs> it all comes from the same place. It all comes from earth. Right. right. Your so, body can't discern, yeah. right? Whether, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, Go on, yeah. Joey. <laughs> and, uh, and with additives, people talk about things like um, emulsifiers and mold inhibitors and all of this crazy stuff. Yes. Wait, I have to jump in. Can I jump yeah. in real quick? Because yeah, say so one just, thing really oh, quick. Yeah. Finish, finish. Yes. Because I'm posting a video tomorrow on this. This lady pulled up Sargento cheese and she's like, it has anti-caking agents. And she goes, and they're not found. These things are not found naturally. And the anti-caking agent that she was pointing to in the ingredients list is cellulose. It's literally fiber. And you oh get cellulose in a lot of plant-based foods, beans, apples, etc. You go, you can go on and on. Like there's cellulose and all this stuff. And the reason why it's added to cheese 
is because the cellulose helps draw in moisture or prevent a drawing moisture. So it, it prevents the cheese from clumping. Right? Mm -hmm. It's okay. Mm -hmm. If you don't want something with cellulose, whatever, get a cheese that doesn't have it. But then she right. like, says like, DM me whatever to, so I can send you some clean cheese. And I'm like, what the hell is clean cheese in the first place? Like it's all What cheese. is Maybe clean cheese? Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess I like dirty cheese. Um, but just r wrapping up with the Yuka app, because I'm yeah. glad that you brought up that example. Um, I, I was looking through some of the reviews and one really stood out to me. Uh, this person wrote, the app is helpful, but not consistent. They need to put more helpful recommendations and alternatives. It's very stressful using the app because everything you scan is toxic. They don't offer alternatives. So basically, I mean, in, in a nutshell, and I saw this in so many of the reviews, it was like it's causing food anxiety because when you when you break things down in this very black or white manner, things are going to look really bad. And then it's like, oh God, well, what can I eat? And then the things that are labeled good tend to be more expensive. Um, you know, Joey, I, we were, we, you mentioned briefly about organic foods. And yes, I know there are some like small studies that might show a minimally, um, you know, increased yeah. nutritional benefit, but really the majority of research shows like there really isn't a nutritional benefit to organic versus conventional. And does it warrant, does it justify the increased price of these yeah. products? You know, it's like, it's out of control. But there's this really, uh, I'm going to link to this in the show notes. This person, what is her name? I think, yeah, Elaine Gittel. She was a, she's a cancer survivor. She wrote this piece in Medium reviewing the app and she was giving some examples. Um, and she, I guess there was, she, she looked at cottage cheese, which I was blown away because I'm thinking cottage cheese, this seems like a very healthy, maybe I'm wrong, yeah. but I have a very healthy food or whatever that means, right? But Yuka gave it a low rating of 45 out of 100. It labeled it as poor and it displayed a yellow light. And the reason for this, as you said, is because it contained an emulsifier, just automatically writing this additive off as dangerous. Um, Yuka does provide scientific references to support its claims. But if you look closely, you could see that they're referencing mouse studies, simulated models that are not directly applicable to human health. They're talking about dosages that are so much you know, higher than anything a human would ever be exposed to from eating a thing of cottage cheese. Um, the, uh, Elaine goes on to say how they contradict themselves. They cite the European Food Safety Agency, um, which is, the, the stance, the F, FSA's stance is that the additive does not raise safety concerns, but then they also maintain that Yuka considers the most recent animal studies. So basically there are inconsistencies that erode the app's credibility. Um, I mean, I could go on and on and on. They also vilify things that have, um, you know, uh, that are high in calories. But then like this person was saying, well, taking my specific situation, I have very low body weight and I actually have been encouraged to gain weight. So I will sometimes reach for something that, you know, has more calories. So yeah. you can't take this very one size fits all approach. So my take on Yuka is that it's an oversimplification. Um, I, I'm scared it's leading to more food anxiety, potentially disordered sure. eating. That's yeah, that's my rating. Yeah, I would probably <laughs> I would probably bet that some of the foods that they say are good to eat to, they probably have some sort of financial incentive in. And I'm just guessing here, but the, for example, like. Uh, Bobby Parrish, Flav City on social media. Don't. He's one of don't even. Yeah, don't get him started. He's one of them, like, he has his own app that does the same thing. I'm not sure if it's, I don't think it's the UGAP. He has his own app that does the same thing. You scan stuff and it tells you good or bad. And a lot yeah. of the things I say that are good or give you an alternative, like, he has an affiliation with them. So it's like, you know, and again, not to inherently say that having an affiliation with a food company is a bad thing. Because it's right. not like mm -hmm. all of us in this space, we need to make a living. And truth be told, the nutrition space is not where you get rich. Right? It's just not. Mm -hmm. um, right. So there's nothing inherently wrong with with having an affiliation with a company. But if you like you have to take in a bird's eye view on this, like if your whole thing is you say certain foods are good and certain foods are bad. And now you have an app and the app tells you yay or nay. And the app tells you that these foods are yay. And the foods that say yay, you have an affiliation with. It's a little bit tricky, right? A hundred percent. 
<laughs> yeah, red yeah. flag. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. And I want to touch on what you said about organic and non-organic, because the main difference there is like organic foods still use pesticides. Like they just use organic pesticides. And two, the term pesticide itself doesn't matter a ton because, again, the dose makes the poison. Three, you can just wash your food if you are scared of pesticide residues. And I think, like most people, you should wash your fruit and your produce anyways because there's dirt and stuff in there. And, like, it's probably not going to do much, but, like, I wash my stuff. I don't want it to be dirty, right? I've bought stuff and I look at it and there's dirt in it. Just, like, wash your fruit. You're going to get rid of a lot of the residues. I really do wish there was a way to simplify things for people because it is complicated. And, like, people do get a lot of anxiety about this stuff, right? Like, should I eat this or should I not eat this? And for people listening, like, you can eat whatever you want. And I know that recommendation, too, is tricky because sometimes people take it as you can eat the same amount of everything. And that's also not true. It's all goal dependence, how much physical activity you have. There's a lot that goes into it. But in general, you can eat whatever you want. And most people know what foods are, quote unquote, healthy and quote unquote, unhealthy. And the goal is really to eat a little bit less, perhaps, of the quote-unquote unhealthy stuff and more of the healthy stuff. Or even not even focus on eating less of the unhealthy stuff, but really focus on eating more of the healthy stuff. Mm -hmm. Eat more lean protein, eat more legumes, eat more whole grains, eat more fruits, eat more veggies. If you intentionally do that, you'll, as a byproduct, reduce the consumption of the highly processed foods that are high in sugar and fat. And the reason why I bring that up is because I, like you, don't think that processing itself is a bad thing, right? Like. There are benefits to processed foods. Mm -hmm. and there are some highly processed foods that are very beneficial as well. I think the issue comes in where we have foods that are highly processed for the sake of palatability, right? For how flavorful they are. So if something is extremely tasty and you have a hard time putting it down, yeah, you probably want to minimize that. Um, you're probably not going to be overeating fortified sliced bread because it's just not that tasty, right? Like right. it just really isn't. But anything that's like high in a combination of, of sugar, fat, and sodium is going to be pretty hyper palatable. Things like chips, cookies, candy, the, the stuff that we know we should probably be eating less of. And what I tend to do with my clients is tell them, like we set certain habits around quantities of things that we should be eating. Like, hey, if you eat no fruits and veggies at the moment, let's target two servings and let's slowly work up till, till we get to five or six servings. Let's have a protein target. Let's follow a regular meal schedule. Let's have a fiber target. And these very basic nutrition related habits, behaviors, rules, whatever you want to call them. And I've noticed that when clients focus on just the stuff that they need to do as a byproduct, they do a little bit less of the other stuff, but it's not mentally taxing. You're not thinking like, don't eat this, don't eat that, don't eat this. You're actually thinking, okay, I need to meet these goals. And that I think has been a much healthier approach for the people that I work with. Love it. Love all of it. Um, this was such a fantastic conversation. Really. Thank you so, so much, Joey. Um, one thing I just wanted to flag real quick about the Yuka app. I was interesting while you were saying that, um, is that their whole premise is that they're totally independent and they don't take funding, which I thought was really interesting. But to your point, I mean, I feel like every other app that I've seen does take funding and do not get me started on Flav City, Bobby Parrish. Totally agree. I mean, also has no actual background in health science or nutrition and just literally walks around grocery stores reading the ingredients uh, and scaring the crap out of people about what, what not to eat. But anyway, um, and so, Joey. And, yeah. and so, uh, like you mentioned, what's the word? Um, contradictory. Because yes. he'll be like, this one has added sugar. Don't eat it. And then he'll point out a food that's like, this one's good. And he doesn't bring it up, but like, you see the ingredients and it's like added sugar. It's like, yeah. Okay. So, and who, who is it? Liam? Do you follow Liam, the plant slant? No. No? Should I'll I? Show you he's yeah. really good. He made one about Bobby, just like all his contradictions. And it was just a skit. Like he's taking notes on what to eat. He's like, oh. okay, no added sugar. And then it's a video of Bobby saying that something with added sugar is fine. And he's like, unless it's in tomato sauce. Right. <laughs> Just like very, very silly like that. Um, it's a great Oh, send video. it to me. I want to see. Oh, that sounds yeah. funny. Um, really, I love your approach to everything. It's just so balanced and nuanced and really refreshing. Everyone, definitely go check out uh, Joey's page. So that's Dr. Dr. Joey Munoz. Of course, I'll link to this in our show notes. Thank you all for tuning in today to Unbiased Science. We hope you learned a thing or two. Definitely follow along on social media at Unbiased SciPod. Subscribe to our Substack newsletter, the unbiasedscipod.substack.com. Totally free to subscribe. We put out a once month, once 
weekly newsletter, excuse me. There is a paid subscription if you're able and willing to support us financially. But again, none of our content goes beyond a paywall. Um, Also, definitely make sure to subscribe on YouTube, leave us a review on Apple, all those good things. And also check out my other podcast, Bites of Health. You can follow along on social media at Bites of Health Pod. That's Bites with a Y. Five minute episodes every day. Um, I interview pediatricians and we answer your commonly asked questions about our kiddos. So check it out. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you next week.